Okay, this is chapter three of this book right here. It's called How to Improve Blood Flow. It has two other titles. The other title is A Tale of Two Toes in a Hot Tub. It's kind of a parody of Jonathan Swift's book, A Tale of a Tub. Um, I wrote this book, gosh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, 2020. Um, you know, I was thinking to myself, Charles Dickens, he would release a book in serial form through the uh, newspaper. And, uh, you know, because he write these books, not many people read books anymore. So I figured, you know what, I can do kind of like what he did just through making videos of the chapters. I already have made videos for chapters one and two. And there's really not a whole lot of plot story. But there's sort of the background of the book is there's there's these two guys. One guy's name is JAS. That really is just his abbreviations for Jonathan Swift. Um, and the other guy's name is Chumpy Dumas. And Dumas is kind of a play on dumbass. Um, and basically it goes through you know, how do patients navigate their problems and what does it take to get better? And there's a lot of nutrition pathophysiology mixed in with it. Um, so anyways, so we can start here in chapter three. Basically, Jonathan Swift has got to go to the podiatrist because he's got athlete's foot and his real goal is he wants to get this girl to go out with him. She's a lifeguard and she doesn't like the, his athlete's foot. Okay, so we'll start here in chapter three of how to improve blood flow. Okay, uh, Jonathan Swift, he says, jazz. He says, what can I do for this athlete's foot? He's going to Dr. Bunyan. Bunyan, of course, is a play on words for Halix valgus. is called a Bunyan. Um, so that's Dr. Bunyan. So he says, did you try the antifungal lotions? Jazz. Yeah, the lotions cured the pain, but the redness is still there. Did you try soaking it in 5% vinegar? Jazz. Yeah, I took the plastic container drawer from the refrigerator and I soaked my foot in that. Gee, I wonder why Betty thinks you're disgusting. Jazz. The vinegar was like a douche for my feet. I did the foot soak while I was using the antifungal lotions. I even soaked my feet in distilled water and then salt water. Dr. Bunyan, why'd you do that? Jazz, because I was trying to create hypoosmolar hell and then hyperosmolar hell for the foot fungi. Uh, Bunyan, well, that's, that's interesting. Uh, Dr. Bunyan, your problem might be atherosclerosis. Jazz, what? Bunyan, a lack of blood supply. Jazz, what causes atherosclerosis? Bunyan. Everybody knows that cholesterol increases atherosclerosis. Jazz, why does cholesterol make it worse? Bunyan, because LDL cholesterol is just the right size to overcome the zeta potential of RBCs. I'm going to have pictures of all this stuff in just a moment. It'll be easier to follow. Jazz, did you swallow a dictionary? What is a zeta potential? And again, I'll have pictures to illustrate all this stuff. Bunyan, red blood cells have a sialic acid residues on their outer surface, which is called their glycocalyx, and it has a negative charge on it. The other RBCs have negative charges, so they repel each other. That's good. So the red blood cells don't stick together while they're flowing in the blood. It's what you want. It keeps the red blood cells separated. This lowers blood viscosity. It makes your blood more like water than like a milkshake. Low viscosity blood promotes laminar flow. With laminar flow, the red blood cells are in the center of the lumen. The white blood cells are adjacent. So here would be like your red blood cells of your hand. Red blood cells in the center. WBC is white blood cells there, and then like the plasma on the outer surface. That's called laminar flow. That's normal. That's what you want. With laminar flow, RBC is in the center, WBC is adjacent, and plasma uh, on the outer surface next to the endothelial cells. Jazz, what happens when LDL cholesterol is high? Okay, so here are, is a red blood cell about 7 microns in diameter. Uh, here is a capillary, which is only about 5 microns in diameter, so the red blood cells are bigger. They have to deform themselves a little bit as they go through. And during that time, there's gas exchange. Oxygen is given to the tissue. CO2 is released from the tissues. When you've got bridging molecules, something that sticks the red blood cells together, and that could be typically LDL cholesterol, um, then the red blood cells are all stuck together as they go through the capillary. This makes your blood thicker, like a milkshake instead of like water. And that makes it harder for the red blood cells to go through the capillary. So blood pressure has to come up in order to push the um, red blood cells through the capillaries because they're all stuck together, the red blood cells. So this is why a high-fat diet causes hypertension. Um, in addition, if you had a lot of sodium, it'll narrow the blood vessels, and that's called vasoconstriction, and that will also raise blood pressure. Okay, here's a picture of a sialic acid. And you could basically, you know, here's a glucose molecule. Sialic acid, there's a little more to it than this, but all you need to know is just think of it as a glucose molecule with a carboxylic acid on there. And by the way, look at this little trick. 
A carboxylic acid is very much like a CO2. So whenever you hear the two, think of them as being almost interchangeable. That'll help you later on whenever we talk about biochem. Okay, sialic acid is like a glucose with a carboxylic acid on it. Okay, so here's the zeta potential. The negative charge around the red blood cell helps repel other red blood cells. But if you've got something positively charged and big enough, like an LDL cholesterol, it'll stick the two red blood cells together. That's called overcoming the zeta potential. And then there's other bridging molecules. Fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is elevated when there's excessive stress. Um, you know, it's part of the acute phase reactant proteins released by the liver. Elevated IgM antibodies with an acute severe infection, it can cause increased clotting of the blood. Uric acid, and when it's high in excessive amounts, that can also function as a bridging molecule, overcoming the zeta potential sticking red blood cells together. The higher the LDL cholesterol, the thicker the blood becomes. The more the red blood cells tend to be stuck together. And that's why cholesterol is definitely, there's been tons of research on this, definitely a risk factor as it gets progressively elevated above 150 for causing a clot in the blood. And by the way, atherosclerosis is a blood clot. You've all heard atherosclerosis is cholesterol. No, cholesterol is the most common cause of atherosclerosis because it's the most common thing that makes the blood prothrombotic, more likely to clot. Okay, and you know, there's the Mr. Fit study, there's the Esselstyn data, the Framingham data, and plenty of other data, all the epidemiologic data. But just so you know that, because there's some people going around the internet saying cholesterol is not a risk factor for coronary disease. That's ridiculous. It's a major risk factor. It's actually the most important one. Okay, so again, we just saw the Rouleau formation. Rouleau means stack of coins in French. So stacking the red blood cells together like a stack of coins because of the high fat meal. Okay, then here's a picture of the laminar flow. RBCs in the center. The blue would be WBCs and the black would represent plasma on the periphery. We talked about that. And here's an example of what that means. You know, there's patients who have cardiac angina. They get chest pain with exertion. So from coronary artery disease, narrowing of the arteries in their heart due to atherosclerosis. And this guy, Peter Quo, a cardiologist in Pennsylvania back in the 1950s, early 1960s, he would feed patients a high-fat diet, and then he would check their, their blood lipids every 30 minutes. And what he found was right when they started reaching peak lipemia, between four to about seven hours, they would get chest tightness, pain in their chest. Um, and that's consistent, you know, correlates directly with the hyperlipemia, correlates with, you know, the high dietary fat causes chest pain because it causes cardiac ischemia, meaning decreased oxygen delivery to the heart muscle. And this was done originally with saturated fat primarily. Later, these experiments were repeated in the 1960s by Meyer Friedman and Ray Rosenman. And what they found was when they fed them, you know, the vegetable oils, because it became popular at the time. Ansel Keys had talked about all the problems with sat fat in the 1940s and 50s, and then that got um, led to a backlash, and people said, oh, well, we need, you know, PUFAs, polyunsaturated fats, like in all the cooking oils, omega-6 fats, but the, what they found was those are even worse. They cause more prolonged sludging of the blood, thickening of the blood, uh, decrease in oxygen delivery to the tissues. In fact, they, they delayed... Uh, caused such delayed, prolonged sludging in the blood that Ray Rosen, that uh, Ray Rosen and Meyer Friedman's workers, they got annoyed by. It. We don't want to sit here all day because it was going beyond nine hours, and they had to, you know, go home, get out with their lives. They start these experiments in the morning. So here's just a picture of red blood cell in a test tube after you draw blood from somebody's arm, and you can see the plasma here. You can see the WBCs, and the fat will also be visible. It'll make the blood noticeably thicker. Most of the cells in blood are red blood cells. Um, and that's why the higher the hematocrit, the higher the blood vis viscosity, the thicker the blood will be. And this also is why some of those bicycle riders that were taking epoetin to elevate their hematocrit had myocardial infarctions because their blood's prone to clotting. You know, they might need that extra hematocrit when they're riding up a hill, for training for the Tour de France, but when they're just laying around in their apartment afterwards, they got this really thick blood increasing their risk of forming clots. Um, normally, red blood cells are removed from the circulation at about 120 days. The spleen can be thought of as like the graveyard for red blood cells. What it does is, you know, we talked about a capillary being about 5 microns, but a, a splenic capillary is even smaller. It's about 3 microns. So the old red blood cells are stiffer because they've got more glycation of their uh, outer surface, and it makes it so they can't get through these 3 millimeter. They can't. It's like doing the limbo. They can't do it, so they get removed from the circulation.
Okay, continuing with the book. And by the way, those illustrations were not in the book. I didn't know how to use that illustration program at the time I wrote the book. If I ever write a future edition, I'll put them in. But just so you know, the 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 book as I'm showing it to you here is not exactly the same as the print book. I got the 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 illustrations are the biggest difference. Um, the text is about the same. Okay, how to improve blood flow? Okay, Dr. Bunyan says the LDL cholesterol sticks the red blood cells together like a stack of coins. French word is rouleau. Um, Jazz says so what? Bunyan says the rouleau makes the blood thick like a milkshake, causes high blood pressure. Atherosclerosis is then caused by the high blood pressure and the tendency to clot of the blood. And atherosclerosis means problems with your heart, your brain, your Johnson, and your feet. Jazz says why? Dr. Bunyan, because blood flow is the river of life. Every organ in your body functions better with good blood flow. Okay, that's a good point. Basically, you want to heal anything, you want to make anything better, improve the blood flow to it. That's a good, simple thing. And doctors don't know that. And so um, it's a good thing to know, and it's pretty simple to know. Reduce dietary fat, reduce dietary sodium. Okay, eat plant foods. All right, Jazz, why does hypertension cause atherosclerosis? Bunyan, increase systolic blood pressure, the upper number of the blood pressure, um, which starts at bifurcations. The high pressure blood hits the dividing uh, median divider between the two branches of the blood vessel, and it can injure that. Plus, it causes a retrograde eddy current that circles backwards, and that abnormal motion of that circling backwards blood confuses the lining cells of the artery, the endothelium, and they perceive it as vessel injury, and they start to express prothrombotic molecules on their cell surface. Okay. Um, normally, the endothelial cells are shaped like a spindle, and they expect blood flow to be along their long axis. Uh, when there's retrograde turbulent flow, it confuses the endothelial cells, and again, they start to express prothrombotic molecules on their cell surface, and a clot will then form at the site of endothelial injury. Normally, EPCs, endothelial precursor cells, will come, and they're from the bone marrow. They'll come and they'll sort of cover up the area of the clot. It'll get reabsorbed, and there's sort of an ongoing steady state relationship. And in a healthy person, the clots get cleared really fast, and they're insignificant. But if a person has a lot of risk factors, you know, high cholesterol, obese, sedentary, that clot will tend to progress. And again, atherosclerosis is a blood clot. Uh, we'll, we'll explain why that is a little bit more in just a moment. Okay, so <clears throat> then when the endothelial precursor cells cover over the blood clot at the site of endothelial injury, that's how the LDL cholesterol gets into the subendothelial space. If you actually become interested in reading about atherosclerosis, that was an important point right there. How does the cholesterol get into the subendothelial space? It gets in there because it's covered by endothelial precursor cells. That's real important if you start debating the, the theory and the causation of atherosclerosis. Okay, so Jazz says, I thought cholesterol was the only thing that mattered. Bunyan, high LDL cholesterol is a major cause of atherosclerosis, but there's multiple other risk factors. Jazz, like anything that causes hypertension? Bunyan, yes. Jazz, and anything that causes high cholesterol? Bunyan will say yes to that. Okay, a couple illustrations here. So here's blood pressure. The number on top is called systolic, which means during contraction. Diastolic is during relaxation, so contraction of the heart, relaxation of the heart. Um, as a person ages, they tend to have less diastolic hypertension because they've lost their Winkessel effect. In the next picture, I'll show you what Winkessel effect is. Winkessel is like that thing you 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 like a looks like an accordion. You push on it to um, blow air on a fire to get the kindling to start to burn. All right, uh, we'll explain how that relates to the ascending thoracic aorta in just a moment. When you lose elastic fibers, you get decreased elastic recoil, meaning decreased diastolic blood flow, which also means decreased coronary artery perfusion. So here's a normal blood pressure. Let's say, you know, 112 over 70. That would be a great blood pressure. Oh, I wrote it as 110 over 70. Okay, the pulse pressure is the difference between the top number and the bottom number, uh, which is 40 in this case. Now here's somebody with hypertension. They're 200 over 100. That's rather severe hypertension. So that's their... Uh, systolic number, their diastolic number, and that's a big wide pulse pressure at 100, the difference between these two numbers. Now, as far as when to treat, that's debatable. There's some doctors like Dr. McDougall. He's probably the best in the world of the nutrition doctors. 
Um, he usually doesn't treat, in his old lecture, he used to say 160. I've heard him more recently say he'll treat with 150 as a threshold to treat. So repeated, consistent, hypertension, persisting, systolics over 150. Uh, that was what he personally recommends. Different doctors will recommend a little lower. You got to be careful though. You know, why is the pressure high in the first place? To get blood to your brain. Okay, think of it. If you're standing up, your brain is the highest thing, the farthest thing to pump up to. Um, so you got to be careful you don't lower your blood pressure too much because you could be underperfusing your brain. Uh, so you got to figure out a happy medium. A wise move is minimize dietary sodium, minimize dietary fat, and let your blood pressure sort of fix itself if possible. That often works, and that's been shown by multiple persons. Uh, Dr. Kempner, Dr. Uh, McDougall, Nathan Pritikin, and plenty of other people have had that same experience. Okay, what does sodium do? This is a whole other topic, but we'll briefly just mention, normally in the diet there should be about, probably in the ballpark of around 10 to 1 to 15 to 1 uh, potassium to sodium, but at least 5 to 1. And if you're eating plant foods, you'll get, easily get more than 5 to 1. You'll be more like 10 or 15 to 1, depending on what you eat. And the point is, our body, all of our cells in our body have these sodium potassium ATP pumps, and those are coupled to all our other ion pumps of the plasma cell membrane, the outer membrane of an individual cell. And when a person eats too much dietary sodium, it starts to accumulate in the cell, and that alters the ion composition of the cytoplasm. And you now have a weaker gradient in terms of the amount of sodium outside the cell compared with the amount inside the cell. They're becoming closer. The gradient is weaker, and that makes it harder for the cell to pump out calcium. So the point is this. Excessive dietary sodium leads to calcium ac accumulation in the smooth muscle cells of the arteries, and that causes them to constrict um, for prolonged amounts of time. So it causes hypertension. So excessive dietary sodium is, is bad because it causes hypertension. It does some other things too, but that's all for our purposes at this lecture here. Oops. Sorry about that. Okay, Winkessel effect. The ascending thoracic aorta... So here's the heart, here's the left ventricle of the heart contracting. The ascending thoracic aorta is like a second heart. Basically, when the heart pumps, it stretches outward, you know, catching the kinetic energy of the cardiac pump. Then when the heart relaxes, the ascending thoracic aorta has elastic recoil and it recoils inward. And so it's that elastic recoil that maintains the diastolic flow, which is real important. The coronary arteries themselves um, are primarily filled during that time. Um, and the more diastolic flow you've got, the lower the blood pressure it takes to get adequate blood to your brain. It's, in terms of atherosclerosis, like we're talking about, the laminar flow should come up here. It's going to hit the median divider, but usually at a normal blood pressure, you get relatively good flow. This is the ECA, external carotid artery. This is CCA, common carotid artery. This would be the ICA, internal carotid artery. And then you'll get a, normally you'll get a little bit of retrograde flow, but not that much. So here's my point. When the pressure is really high, it hits this median divider harder, and you get an excessive amount of turbulent retrograde flow. And it always happens on this far wall. I look at CT angiograms almost every day, and I can tell you this is where it always happens. Okay, Once in a while, the vessel will have a strange tortuous anatomy or something, but in general, this is where it always happens. And it's the same in the heart in the sense that it's right at bifurcations where atherosclerosis starts. And it begins with a clot on the wall of the vessel. And you can tell it's a clot. It's the same density as a blood clot. And let me also tell you a great secret of atherosclerosis. Who's the best doctors at atherosclerosis? So the usual thing people say, and what I would have thought, you know, 20-something years ago, well, gee, it's got to be, you know, the vascular surgeons because they always operate on the arteries, or the cardiothoracic surgeons because they operate on the arteries, or it's going to be, um, you know, cardiologists because they're putting in stents a lot in the coronaries, or maybe an interventional radiologist, they put a lot of stents in the lower extremity arteries. But here's what I've learned. The people who know atherosclerosis best, the 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 group of physician specialists who know atherosclerosis best is a pathologist. And you say, well, why the pathologist? The reason is they look at it under a microscope. They know exactly what they're looking at, all right? Plus, a pathologist doesn't care. A cardiologist can't say something that's going to decrease the amount of stenting or decrease the amount of medications prescribed. That's their business, okay? They get booted out of cardiology, okay? You think some surgeon is going to say something that's going to decrease the number of operations? That wouldn't make them look good in their field, okay? But pathologist doesn't care. He just says, I look at it under a microscope. Atherosclerosis, it's a blood clot. 
And the best book ever is Gregory Sloop's book about cardiovascular pathophysiology and hematology. It's the best book. I've read tons of stuff about atherosclerosis. I did a fellowship, by the way, at Harvard in interventional radiology with the emphasis on vascular disease. And I've been interested in vascular disease for, gosh, now 25 years in some detail. And I can tell you, the pathologists are the best. And the best theory that explains atherosclerosis is atherothrombosis theory. We're not going to go into all that now. i got plenty of other lectures on that. But that's an important thing to know. Because why does that matter? Anything that increases blood clotting increases atherosclerosis. Anything that makes the blood thicker increases atherosclerosis. Okay, here is just showing that the endothelial cells, kind of like your hand, they're shaped like a spindle. And normally the blood flow should be parallel to the long axis, so it should go like this. When you have this turbulent flow coming backwards, it confuses the endothelial cells. They've got these little cilia-like um, receptors that sense, mechanoreceptors that sense that the flow is abnormal and they start to express prothrombotic material. They're sensing injury. You know, they don't want the person to bleed to death, but they're just confused. They're confused because, you know, they don't have this much hypertension, prolonged, consistent, um, under normal circumstances. Humans aren't made to eat high fat diets, okay? Um, the platelets, the main thing they do, they do a whole bunch of things here, but for our purposes, the main thing they do is they <clears throat> release nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. Um, keeps the vessels open, and it also has an antiplatelet effect to prevent the platelets from clotting. Also, what's interesting is endothelial cells on their surface, they've got something called heparin sulfate, and that has a lot of negative charge. So the endothelial cell has its own zeta potential, which is kind of interesting. You know, the electrical properties of the body are a fascinating thing. You know, if you have a person who's hit by a car and they die, okay, what's the difference between they're alive and they're dead? When they're alive, they're maintaining their ionic gradients. When they're dead, they're not, all right? They still got the same chemicals in their body, but it's not just the chemicals. It's the electrical properties of all these chemicals that generate life. All right, so nitric oxide is the good thing. That's the most important thing to know because sodium is going to diminish nitric oxide. That's why it causes problems, all right? And saturated fat's also going to diminish uh, nitric oxide. You don't want that. Okay, here's just an example of an atherosclerotic plaque. And to some extent, it kind of goes in order. An acute clot forms. We usually don't see the acute part of the clot. We usually see the chronic uh, clot. And the APCs are endothelial precursor cells that come and cover it up. And that's how the clot gets subendothelial beneath the endothelial lining. So they just form adjacent to the other endothelial cells. And then the immune system cells get in there and they start to reabsorb parts of it. And it turns into fibrous tissue. You get fibroblasts laying down fibrous tissue. So um, what can be reversed? The necrotic core, so that's the dead cells, they can all be reabsorbed. The lipid core, which is the fat accumulating from the plasma cell membranes or the RBCs that were in this original clot, that can all be reabsorbed. So an atherosclerotic plaque can shrink significantly. Calcified part usually will not go away. But the point is you get some, if a person goes on a low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet, this atherosclerotic plaque can shrink, so they'll get more blood flow through their arteries. In addition, um, once they reduce their dietary sodium and their dietary fat, the endothelial cells will start to function better, and the artery will just open up in its diameter. So people have often noticed a dramatic improvement in their symptoms in just less than a week uh, once they switch from eating the high-fat, you know, standard American diet makes people sick, to the low-fat, low-sodium plant-based diet. And the older you get, the more fragile you get. You have less endothelial precursor cells. So the smart move is get your act together. The sooner the better. Uh, make life easier for your body. Get better blood flow to your tissues. Avoid all kinds of problems. Okay, continuing with the book here. How to Improve Blood Flow, Chapter 3. Bunyan, yes. Jazz. And what else? Bunyan. Anything that increases hematocrit, like smoking tobacco, uh, polycythemia vera, epoetin, the medication that increases uh, red blood cells, those will all increase hematocrit, increase blood viscosity, and therefore cause hypertension. The tobacco causes hypoxia, so <clears throat> the body tries to compensate by raising the hematocrit. Jazz. And anything else that increases chronic psychological stress because of the elevated adrenaline, also called epinephrine. Bunyan. Yes, catecholamine hormones will increase blood pressure. Jazz. And does chronic stress <clears throat> decrease immune function? Bunyan, yes. Catecholamines can function as siderophores. Sidero means iron, four means to transfer. And they can facilitate bacterial uptake of iron. So a pro person who's chronically severely stressed is more likely to get bacterial infections. Normally the body prevents activation of dormant bacteria by sequestering iron. They keep it trapped inside cells bound to ferritin or in the blood bound to transferrin. Cortisol is also a powerful immunosuppressant. 
Jazz, what effect does cortisol have on atherosclerosis? Bunyan, it makes it worse. Jazz, why? Presumably because cortisol decreases the ability of the immune system, like macrophages, to reabsorb blood clots. In addition, it increases blood lipids. In addition, it causes insulin resistance. Okay, and now why is that kind of funny? Okay, I'll tell you why it's funny. Because there's a group of cardiologists trying to say, oh, atherosclerosis is partly due to high cholesterol, but there's a component that's not due to high cholesterol. It's due to inflammation. Therefore, take our anti-inflammatory drug. But I'm laughing because it's a blood clot, okay? It's prothrombotic. And here's the most powerful anti-autoimmune, you know, anti-immune system medication, cortisol. And if it was primarily inflammatory, you would think that cortisol would make it better. No, cortisol does the opposite. The anti-inflammatory makes it worse. So if it was largely inflammatory, wouldn't the anti-inflammatory make it better? That's why that's funny. And what the pathologist will tell you is they'll say, look, we look at we look at atherosclerosis through a microscope. They say, we're looking down the microscope and we don't see that much inflammation. It's not inflammation's not the issue here. Um, they say it's a blood clot. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning that, you know, if you look at it also on a CAT scan or something, it looks like a resorbing hematoma, a small resorbing hematoma in the wall of an artery, a blood clot. Okay, and it recanalizes like a blood clot, and it's laminated like a blood clot under a microscope. Okay, um, there is some good inflammation trying to repair something and heal it, and then there's bad inflammation when there's sort of an unnecessary uh inflammation like causing arthritis or problem in other locations when the immune system is dysfunctional. Uh, reabsorbing a subendothelial blood clot is good. It's how the body fixes itself to repair the artery. Oh yeah, the other thing people tell you is, well, we know there's inflammation because CRP is elevated. CRP is C-reactive protein. Uh, but C-reactive protein can also be elevated to function as a myokine. Why would it do that? A myokine means something released by the muscle. It'll do that in the setting of hypoxia. Hypoxia can happen due to high fat in the blood. So the skeletal muscle cell is not able to replace its glycogen as rapidly as it would expect you know, after eating a meal. And, and in response, it'll cause the release of CRP, the acute phase reaction. You know, come from the liver. But the, the reason I'm saying all this is, this is an important point. What is atherosclerosis? It is a blood clot. So anything that makes you prone to clotting is going to cause atherosclerosis. And inflammatory things can worsen it by making you prone to clotting, but they're not intrinsic to the disease. And that ends up being good to know. Um, so Jazz says, if I understood you correctly, you just said atherosclerosis is just a blood clot. Bunyan, yes, atherosclerosis is just a blood clot. Jazz, well, what about the story of the fatty streaks progressing to become atherosclerotic plaque? Bunyan. Fatty streaks are different than atherosclerotic plaques. Fatty streaks contain a different type of lipid than atherosclerotic plaques. Jazz. Well, where does the lipid come from in an atherosclerotic plaque? Bunyan. It comes from the LDL cholesterol and from the phospholipids in the red blood cell membranes, like the plasma membranes. Jazz. What about the theory that atherosclerosis was initiated by inflammation? Bunyan. It seems unlikely, given that cortisol makes it worse. Okay, uh, continuing here with uh, how to improve blood flow, chapter three. Jazz says, what about the outside-in theory of atherosclerosis that's initiated in the vasovasorum of the adventitia? So that means there's another theory by this, primarily by this German cardiac surgeon named Haverach. He says he thinks atherosclerosis comes from the outer wall and it causes ischemia of the wall. And once it blocks up the tiny vessels in the outer wall, it'll cause them to thrombose and become injured. And he thinks that that's contributing to the growth of the plaque. And I actually think it contributes, but it's not the main thing. It's not even close to being the main thing. Um, so Bunyan, yes, Dr. Haverach wrote a good book about that. The vasorum theory emphasizes microvascular disease and the microvascular plays an important role, especially in the descending thoracic aorta and the abdominal aorta where there's only sparse small branch arteries like the intercostals and the lumbars. I can tell you though, I spoke to the other like world expert research on this and their feeling is the flow is so complex and turbulent in the aorta that the hypertension itself can explain a lot of the atherosclerosis in the uh, descending thoracic aorta and the abdominal aorta. So what they're basically saying is they don't think Vessor, they don't think Haverich is right about this wall of the artery stuff. What's interesting about Haverich's theory about it being caused by 
the adventitia or the serosa, the artery, same thing, is that that can explain why do aneurysms of the aorta have the same risk factors as atherosclerosis. And Haveridge will say it's because you form little clots in the outer layer of the wall of the artery, and when that infarcts, it weakens the wall and it's prone to expanding with high hypertension. Okay, be that as it may, the bottom line is you're double screwed with all these atherosclerosis risk factors. You're not only prone to f forming arterial stenosis, you're also prone to forming aneurysms. But, you know, aneurysms aren't that common a cause of death. I mean, I hardly ever see a patient die from an aneurysm. Um, I see people dying and suffering all day long, every day, tons of them from atherosclerosis. All right, so Jazz continues with his questions. What about the veins? Uh, Bunyan says, the veins normally don't get atherosclerotic plaques because blood pressure in the veins, let's say the legs, for example, is relatively low. But when a vein is taken from the leg and used for cabbage, CABG is coronary artery bypass graft, then the atherosclerotic plaques can form on it. Um, one point Dr. Haveridge said was that arteries like the internal mammary, which is famous for high patency rates in cabbage, doesn't get atherosclerosis because it has hardly any vasovasorum. And there might be some truth to that. Others will say it's just because there's no branches on it, um, virtually no branches on it, hardly any significant branches. Um, Jazz, does anybody dispute the outside in vasovasorum theory? Bunyan, yes, of course. Atherosclerosis is multifactorial. And like we said, anything that increases blood pressure or blood clotting or causes endothelial injury will increase atherosclerosis. Dr. Gregory Sloop, the great pioneer of atherothrombosis theory, has shown that atherosclerotic plaques form in a prosthetic dialysis graft. Okay, now that's a big statement. And the reason why that matters is a prosthetic graft, it doesn't have an endothelium. It doesn't have a vasovasorum. It's just the atherosclerotic, the blood cells clotting in the graft, and then they look like atherosclerosis and then they get covered with endothelial precursor cells. So again, I think that's funny. So why is that funny? Because this guy, Sloop, he's kind of a genius, and basically he's just refuting, you know, here's what I'd say. Cardiologists, vascular surgeons, interventional radiologists, and uh, thoracic, cardiothoracic surgeons, they think about atherosclerosis like a plumber. Where is the blockage? Should we put a stent in to prop it open? Should we bypass it? And you know, that's good. That's an important part of taking care of patients. But the reason why Sloop, the pathologist, understands atherosclerosis so much better is he's just trying to understand what is atherosclerosis, looking at it with a microscope, reading all the papers on it. Okay, so he doesn't care if it gets treated with a stent or a medication or surgery or diet. He just wants to understand what it is. And that uh, William C. Roberts is also um, very good. He's a pathologist. I talked about him in other lectures. And he's got lectures online that are pretty good. William C. Roberts lectures on atherosclerosis on YouTube. Um, Bunyan continues. How, or, or Jazz says, how could atherosclerotic plaque form in a graft when the graft has no intima, the prosthetic dialysis graft? Bunyan, because the EPCs, endothelial precursor cells, come from the bone marrow. Jazz, well, that's all fine and dandy, but what can I do to prevent my atherosclerosis? Bunyan. Do the things that improve endothelial cell function. Avoid the things that worsen it. Avoid things that increase blood viscosity. So what can you do to prevent atherosclerosis? Eat a starch-based diet and fruits. Um, eat plant foods because they got a lot more potassium and magnesium, which are vasodilators. Avoid processed food because it's high in sodium, vasoconstrictor, that also inhibits endothelial nitric oxide and raises blood pressure. Eat cruciferous vegetables. Yeah, they're good. They promote increased nitric oxide, the whole sulfurophane in the mouth and all that. Get sunshine. It activates subcutaneous nitric oxide precursors. Get your sunshine also so you'll have activated vitamin D. It's much better to get it from the sun than to take a pill for it. So D3 is the active form of it. Okay, how to improve blood flow. Chapter 3 continued. Avoid meat because it's high in cholesterol, high in fat. Um, it raises LDL cholesterol. The animal protein is also atherogenic. Animal protein just by itself will increase cholesterol levels. Then, of course, there's the TMO, the leaky gut, all the inflammation problems, the xenocyelitis. Those are topics for another day, but meat does numerous things. It's not only like the worst thing for cancer. It's just about the worst thing for atherosclerosis. And vegetable oils are, are sort of equal to meat in causing health problems. You don't want to ever eat vegetable oils. Um, the epidemiology of all this, the Pima in Arizona eat the SAD diet. They were sort of a combined population with the Tatahumata in northern Mexico. And after the Mexican-American War in 1848, the Pima got pulled into uh, Arizona, and they have now eat the standard American diet. And they have a tremendously high incidence of obesity, diabetes, coronary artery disease, all the 
you know, the vascular diseases associated with a high-fat diet. Tadahumata in northern Mexico kept their old traditional plant-based diet with lots of corn and beans, um, and they're really healthy. They're famous for running marathons and ultra-marathons even. We talked about avoiding sodium. Uh, the South American Yanomama, like in the Amazon jungle, they also don't add any salt to their food. They eat an endemic plant-based diet. They got normal blood pressure their whole life. Check their blood pressure in their 70s. It's normal like when they were teenagers. Um, they only eat about 200 milligrams a day of sodium. The average American's eating way, way more than that. Uh, people who eat the, the standard American diet can eat far more than that. Some some papers will tell you they only eat on average of around 4,000 milligrams a day. It depends what you're to read, depends on the population, but it's very easy to get your sodium up high. One box of cereal could have 5,000 milligrams of sodium. When I was younger, I used to eat the entire box of cereal like that, you know, uh, with skim milk. Um, and then imagine if they're having a hot dog, cheeseburger, a lot of uh, meat foods. They're preserved with, with salt. Salt tastes good. So people can get very high sodiums. Um, Jazz, I get it. Improving blood flow will help me to heal my athlete's foot. So are there any other benefits? Bunyan, uh, better, better blood flow improves everything. It'll have better blood flow to your brain, uh, better Woody's with the Johnson, more energy. And so Jazz says, okay, I'm going to keep track of how many random Woody's I get this month and Woody, Woody Veritas. So anyway, so that's uh, the end of Chapter 3. I think that's the end here. pretty sure. All right, so I hope that was helpful. We'll do chapter four soon.